This week on Arizona Illustrated, we celebrate the end of the year with stories of compassion, giving, and hope. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. According to Humanium, an international children's rights organization, a quarter of Mexican children live in poverty. For these children, access to basic health care is difficult, and specialized care for those with severe medical issues is almost impossible to be had. Yet, there is a group of volunteers who, for more than 40 years, have offered children and their families smiles and a chance for a much better life. On the first Thursday of every month, nearly 300 children and their families cross the border from Mexico into Nogales, Arizona. With the cooperation of Customs and Border Protection, children without visas, accompanied by a parent or guardian, are granted special permission to enter the U.S. for health care reasons. They travel by bus and van to this dirt parking lot three miles north of the border. Children with a variety of disabilities arrive with their families and gather. There is food and water, kids play, mothers hold their babies, stories are shared. For some, it is their first visit. Others have been making this journey since birth. We've had people who literally travel uh, over a thousand miles. We've had people who come from the southern part of Mexico that will easily have, uh, take uh, a two-day bus trip. And you can just imagine what a two-day bus trip is for you and I, let alone a uh, child who has a disability, uh, just trying to carry them onto the bus and trying to take care of their needs, whether it's feeding or changing their diaper or, or other necessities. Francisco Valencia is a pediatric orthopedist from Tucson and the medical director here at St. Andrew's Children's Clinic. The nonprofit clinic has been providing free medical care to impoverished Mexican children for more than 40 years and receives no government funding. It relies exclusively on grants and private donations. Well, our clinic is a church. St. Andrews is a church, but there's no proselytizing going on. And the church has been very gracious that they rent out the facility to the clinic for a dollar a day and they vacate the premises and we essentially take over the premises and we pretty much occupy every corner and every nook of this facility. The nearly 50 members of the professional health care staff volunteer their time. For Valencia, it is a calling. I grew up here on the border. My parents are from here. My, my extended family is from here and this is a way for me to, to give back to the community. At age 15, Valencia injured his knee playing basketball and went to see Tucson orthopedist Mark Frankel for care. He expressed a curiosity about the doctor's work. And in the process of the normal banter, he said, well, if you're interested in medicine, why don't you come and follow me at the clinic? At that time, the clinic was across the line in the Buenos Aires neighborhood of Nogales, Sonora. That's when young Francisco Valencia was first introduced to the mission of St. Andrews. Well, we were in a hot, stuffy room in this orphanage that was run by the nuns, and the doctors were taking off some bloody bandages after a surgery, and they were very pleased. And my first gut instinct and reaction was, I'm not sure this is for me. Uh, I felt sick, sick to my stomach. I had to excuse myself, and then about Five minutes later, the, the second thought that crossed my mind was that, wow, something good is happening here. Valencia became a trusted interpreter, sharing good news and bad with families seeking answers. His experience at the clinic would lead him to become a doctor and choose pediatric orthopedics as his specialty. Now in private practice, he makes the journey each month leading the medical team and serving these children. All right, para servirle. Okay, buen día. We just saw a child today that just walked in and, and is seven years old and it's never seen and has never had any medical attention. That's, that would be something that would be almost unheard of up in Tucson or any other community in, in the United States. 
The children who come to the clinic suffer from a wide variety of disabilities and medical conditions, including cleft palate, spina bifida, brittle bone disease, epilepsy, and speech impediments. Some have no speech at all. Others were born without arms or legs. Pues, me parece que es muy importante porque ayuda a todos los niños, lo que lo, los que lo necesitan. Pues, para mí también, también he, me han dado su ayuda. 16-year-old Lupita Montez Gutierrez is from Nogales, Sonora. Her feet were so badly deformed at birth that doctors determined she would never walk. When she was two years old, she underwent a bilateral amputation below the knees. This is Lupita at age four, visiting the clinic, having her prostheses adjusted. Now she walks. On this day, Lupita is back for another adjustment. After years of care, Lupita walks with confidence and enjoys the everyday life of a teenager. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, impair her in any way, you know, she, it's normal. It's normal for you? Uh, it's normal. Once a patient begins treatment, the clinic continues care until age 18. While the care is free, it's not cheap. Shriners Hospitals conducted nearly $3 million worth of pro bono patient surgeries for the children of St. Andrews in 2012. No. No. I'm always in awe when I see my colleagues who are able to help a child communicate with the aid of, of a communication board, that they're able to hear because they now have a hearing aid or, the, or something very low tech as a, a pair of glasses. If we can take a child who is not doing well in school because they can't see and we are able to change their, their life where they, they can pay better attention in school, they can do better in school because they, they can now see the blackboard and see what the lesson plan is. <laughs> to see these patients who, because of where they live or because of their access to health care, would you know, maybe have a lifelong impairment, but with the right intervention at the right time, they could live a normal and healthy life. It's really, really phenomenal. Uh, we were successful technically, but... Troy Tenney is a graduate student at the University of Arizona, studying cellular and molecular medicine. He plans to become a doctor and has been making the trip to St. Andrews for nearly a year, long enough to see repeat patients and learn alongside the doctors who care for them. Next time we see them. Oh, they are really awesome about explaining the clinical history, you know, what the disease is and how it's causing the impairment. So they, they're really great educators. You could tell they're passionate about what they're doing. This experience is beginning to shape Troy Tenney's future, as it did for Dr. Valencia all those years ago. I'd like to continue that kind of volunteer spirit in some, some way, shape, or form in, in my own practice. I feel like the little that I've given here, I've been able to receive you know, so much more, both in perspective and exposure. So it's, it's been a really beneficial experience for me. Lupita Montez Gutierrez has plans for her future, too. For other children who may face similar challenges, she offers this advice. There's always negative news that comes out of the board. We always hear about the, the drug trafficking, we always hear about the violence, we always hear about the immigration issues and, and the ugliness of the wall that goes up. But we never really hear about the, the positive things that, that people do on the border. And this is one of those grassroots activities that really has made a difference in their community. And what I would hope that we continue to do is that we make people aware that in their own backyard that something good is happening. The Sonoran Desert is a land of extremes. Overnight temperatures this time of year often dip into the 30s and lower. Those living without homes are in constant need of hot food and nourishment. For nearly 10 years, a local group of volunteers hit Tucson streets to offer help one cup at a time. We serve right out of the back. We have a hot chocolate uh, soup. 
and we try and get blankets. They usually provide those, uh, and we haven't got any right now. They come actually from FEMA if we get them. Okay. I try and get this as full as possible so nothing flops around, you know. It's Thursday night at Most Holy Trinity Church on Tucson's west side. Jerry Streisick and the rest of his team are loading the Matthew 25 Ministries van with soup, hot chocolate, bread, and other supplies before they head out to serve Tucson's homeless. Tonight, they are the soup patrol. Put it in these big containers and we serve it. As the name implies, the main course is hot soup. The girls tested it for heat. We have to test it for heat. We're all, we're controlled by the state has come in and inspected our kitchens and everything like that and then things like that. So uh, we're up to code, you know. We need an empty case. I'd like to have another empty case. Weekdays, the soup is prepared by Cary Dodd Community Kitchen, a program of the Community Food Bank. On weekends, volunteers at Most Holy Trinity do the cooking in their own kitchen. Priscilla Streisick is Jerry's wife and a member of tonight's soup patrol. They're yeah, right. always hungry, and it's just amazing to give someone a piece of bread and see them start eating it immediately. It just brings tears to your eyes to know they're that hungry. You know, you can't help but be moved. Jerry and his wife Priscilla are snowbirds who spend their winters in Tucson and their summers in Wisconsin. The Streisicks have volunteered in this effort nearly every Thursday night for the past six years. Tonight, they ride with Ella Kelly and Mary McBride. And Ella's a friend of ours that doesn't even belong to our parish. She's a friend that, that just wanted to join in doing this, and she's helped us. Then Mary's also. been here six yeah, months, yeah, right. and she just Already jumped right in. Building, yeah. They are four out of nearly 70 volunteers who make up the Matthew 25 ministry, which is one of numerous church-based groups finding ways to serve the homeless in Tucson. For those sleeping under bridges, on park benches, in doorways, or bus stations, for those who can only find shelter for the night, but must wander in the daytime. For families broken because they could not afford to pay their At rent. the church, before we leave, we say a prayer, and then we talk about who wants to do what. Do you want to serve hot chocolate, soup? What do you want to do? And then we just go and do it. You want to do the cocoa? They leave the church promptly at 620 and will make seven stops over the next couple of hours. When we try to be on time because they're waiting there for us. Their day is, you know, they have things to do too also. So we try and be there at a certain time. Some people want to talk, some don't. But it, it is, I think it's, I think that's an important part of it too. It's just to, you know, make somebody feel respected and like you're not just, you know, shoving something at them or whatever. Just, you know, hello, how you doing? Just takes a minute to do that. Sometimes that's pretty important. The first stop is Esteban Park, south of Speedway near I-10. The team arrives promptly at 6.30, and a group of men have already gathered around the van. Oh, man. Along with hot soup, they offer clothes and well wishes. The men are mostly quiet. They represent a handful of the more than 2,200 counted in last year's homeless street count, organized by the Tucson Pima Collaboration to End Homelessness. Most folks who work in social services agree that point in time survey does not paint an accurate picture of the actual numbers. Next stop for the Soup Patrol is the downtown library. That's a good one. Thank you very much, sir. God God bless. Bless you. My name's Dan Dunn. I just recently moved to Tucson January 4th, about a year and four days ago, five days ago. And uh, moved here because my three granddaughters live here. And uh, I want to spend more time with them. We're getting the age, we really need to know their grandpa a little better. I got some hot cocoa and some good, really tasty stew here. Some beef stew, it looks like. Hot food anytime, in the morning, at night, anytime. Hot food's good. You know what I mean? Man needs to eat. Soup Patrol organizers say their numbers are up over previous years. One night in November, they served nearly 200 people. Jerry says the previous Thursday, they served 176. He also sees a change in the population. The one thing that I see is, and we've seen that tonight too, some young people, some children, and you see sometimes more of that and more ladies. It used to be mostly a lot of men, you know, but you see more ladies now too. And I think that's one change, and the numbers are up too. But, that, that, you know, you're seeing more of that. Thank you. A lot of times what we eat is like cold food sandwiches and the likes of that. So having a hot hot meal, hot food, really makes a big difference. William says he's grateful for the Soup Patrol and their work. He shares a similar concern for his homeless brethren. Occasionally we'll grab soups because there's like a number of people that actually camp at this location here. So 
Like, we look out for those people. And then, of course, there's leftovers. Someone comes the next morning or whatever and says, hey, you got anything to eat? We're like, yeah, sure, here you go. Thank you very much. No problem. Do you know if that's your actual hair or if that's just part of the hat? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> now I have, like, many, many blankets. You know, I keep, that's one thing I keep. <laughs> my blankets and my sleeping bags. And I camp right next to a soup patrol spot. Some of these guys wouldn't even eat if you guys weren't out here. Last stop on this night is Viente de Augusto Park in downtown Tucson. And if we got anything left over, we got a couple other places that we go also. If we have food left over, places where people are in need of food. I mean, when you're out on the streets, you know, warm, warm food at 7 o'clock at night, it's just, you know, keeps, it makes it so you can sleep. Josh, who is 37, says he and his wife Beverly are recent arrivals and that aside from the occasional get a job shouted from a passing car, people in Tucson have been kind and generous. They've been living on the streets for just over a year. Homeless people are people too, you know, I mean, they're just, they're just trying to get by just like everybody else. And maybe they had something really, you know, nobody knows, they haven't walked in their shoes. They don't know what they've been through or what happened to them, I mean. Everybody's, there's hundreds of thousands of us, you know what I mean? So everybody's got a different story. Jerry and Priscilla Streisick say their work on the Soup Patrol over the past six years has been rewarding in many ways, and that giving back has brought them joy and new perspectives. Well, we feel completely different about that, you know, because, I mean, I think at one time in my life, and I think maybe a lot of people, you just look down. You know, I don't look down at these people anymore. I feel, feel sorry for them, and I wish well for them. And, like Priscilla said, everybody has a story. We, all have, we don't know what happened. We know what their situation is. You know, yeah, sometimes you just think that they just want to be like this. I don't think and, this is a first choice yeah, for right, anybody. No. The Curry Dodd Community Kitchen is a program of the Community Food Bank, which has been providing hot meals and sack lunches to low-income residents in Tucson for almost two decades. It also offers an opportunity for people looking for a fresh start through a unique culinary training program. Please take notes so you can remember a lot of this stuff. I want to get it to where you're accurate. So we're going to start off with accuracy and then we will build on speed. We'll start off a little bit slow, make sure we keep all our digits, and then we'll work up a little bit quicker and a little bit quicker and get that knife closer to our hand. You get that knife close to your hand, honestly, it's a whole lot safer. You think, wow, getting a sharp blade next to my hand is safe? Well, the answer is yes, because you really know where it's going all the time. Uh, my name is John Wardis. I'm the executive chef of Caridad Community Kitchen. Uh, we're a program of the Food Bank of Southern Arizona. Try to get ourselves about a half. A Almost 15,000 meals every month is gonna go out to nine different congregate meal sites, churches, shelters, that families and adults will go to uh, if that need a hot meal. So whether they're in need of a dinner at one of the congregate meal sites, or they're gonna go to one of the churches or shelters for a sack lunch, we need to be there for them. Slicing, I know as far as I move my hand back. Is as wide Along with that, we've developed a culinary training program for people that have challenges to employment. We have a 10-week program that works them all the way through knife skills, cooking skills, safety and sanitation, all the way through to the grand buffet that they have at graduation. There's prep cooks, there's line cooks, there's dishwashers, there's different levels of chefs that are in the kitchen, and they all have tasks to do. And it's the team effort, and that's what we're going to see here. Uh, we're going to talk about stuff that we purchase, we have 12 students from all walks of life, and they come to us with a whole different level of skill sets. Some of them have never cooked. Uh, different age ranges, really wanting to explore the world of the culinary arts. All right, so we're going to come in here. Actually quite blown away to be picked. You know, I'm 58 years old, and I thought, would they take a chance on somebody who was older? And said, no, we see you as someone who's bringing experience and skills. It's what, again, it's a non-judgmental thing. It's just, yeah. we want to get to know. It's, uh, it's taking me back school days. You know, it's eight hours school. I mean, trying to absorb all the verbal informations, books and all that. It's, 
First day might be a little bit too much. We'll see how the second day goes on. This is a for mixture for dry and dry and moisture. Correct. The culinary training is amazing that we do, but it is nothing without the life skills and job skills that go with it. So it's really great if you know how to cook, uh, but if you cannot hold the job, perform well, maintain a good work ethic, have a great interaction with your staff, then it's kind of a moot point. It's where you will get to know each other really well. Mise en place is the cornerstone of what we do in the kitchen. It means everything in its place, meaning we need all of our food, we need all of our tools to do our job, and it also comes in the form of mental mise en place. We need to understand what it is we're doing. You gotta remember the tools are good, and you gotta let them do their work. This here is our paddle. So when we're in the 40 gallon tilt skillet, you're not gonna do a whole lot of good with a little spoon. We'll do cleaning drills three times a day where we stop what we're doing, sweep, empty the garbage, clean our stations, do some dishes, and then we go back at it. We set all the dance steps in motions, but you do the dancing. And again, when it works well, it is amazing. We've got a big day today, 700 meals are going out. So it's going to be busy. We've made it through a little over half of the chicken fabrication. We are very, very strict. You can't be literally a minute late. Season them, sear them. We've lost four out of the 13 that we started with. Get some nice color on them. There is no gray area, and we're just sticking to our word. And then we got to build. You're held to a high bar, but you're not expected to know it without practice. So if you get it wrong, you will be reminded how to do it right, until you can do it right. If you hit pasta in there, you know how pasta has to My view on teaching is a no-pass policy. If it's wrong, it's wrong. It needs to be corrected. Watch behind you, Jen. So I'm very vigilant. As soon as a mistake is made, be it an interaction with another student or an incorrect knife cut, I act upon it in the moment. We are talking today, and one of our students was going, excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me, it's not excuse me. It's coming through behind, hot, something to indicate that you're there, you're present, and you need to get by. If you cannot hold your own personality and speak your truth when you need to, you're not gonna make it past your first six months. And Habib and myself will get chicken going. How you work here is truly how you're gonna work out there when you get a job. So really, we wanna give you really good work habits, really good work ethic and develop that sense of passion for what you're doing. It's not just a job. See how easy you go through that? Okay, now do it the same thing with the other one. One of the great things about Habib, he's a perfectionist. He has a lot of questions in the kitchen, and it's just nice because he wants to get almost what it seems like he feels he's missed. I was born and raised in California, in LA. From gangs, you know, injecting drugs literally from being stabbed, from doing harm. Been to prison, spent 12 years, 17 years old till I was 30 years old, and I'm 38. I'm still at an age to be able to, thanks to my wife and my family to love, you know, to be able to have my children. It's nice to meet you. This is the baby. The great thing for Habib is he really understands that this is a second chance. He's also left that part behind. So he's made the cut to now he's moving on. All right. What a great, great journey. I gave up a baby when she was three. Oh, tears. <laughs> so, 13 years later, I had another one, a baby girl. And I got a second chance. And I'm telling you, I gave it 150%. And um, I believe I was a wonderful mum. <laughs> she says I was a wonderful mum. Even the child I gave up says, mum, you got a second chance. <laughs> so I know what that feels like. So there isn't a person in this room that I don't feel a kinship with. As I say, welcome on day one. <sighs> At the end, I say thank you. Showing up every day. Thank you for your hard work every day. You've given us so much. We want you to build a career, a lifestyle, and we are just as strong as our alumni. 
you've just made that alumni team a whole lot stronger. Okay. Good job, man. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm very excited that you could all join us at our graduation tonight. I'd like to go ahead and bring in Class 11. So I hope they develop a sense of who they are and how food brings us all together. We all have that in common. Food is a commonality we have to have. So we all have to eat each and every day. But the more we can enjoy that and do that together, I think that's something that we learn. That, you know, it's all about being together when we do it. <laughs> and I guess you can attune it to raising a child. You gotta give them all the tools. They've got all those tools in the box. They gotta just arrange them, put them orderly, mise en place, which is what we talk about all the time, be organized, and take it out there in the right way. And they've gotta run with it. For more on the Caridad Community Kitchen, visit communityfoodbank.org. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. Next week, the passion, persistence, and imagination of one of Tucson's most original architects. I just think she was way before her time. The Ramada House is the best modern house in Tucson. A special documentary presentation the architect, Judith Chafee. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.